Hello and welcome to episode 36 of Counterthought. This episode will be talking about health freedom and in a few minutes we'll be joined by Kalina, also known as that Liberty Chick, and we will be discussing with her health freedom and her health freedom mission. But before Kalina joins us, I want to take a few minutes to just talk about the word freedom. Did you know that there are more than there are 17 definitions for the word freedom? There are two, though, that I believe best best apply to what we're going to be talking about in regards to health freedom in this episode. The first definition of freedom is the power to exercise choice and make decisions without constraint from within or without. Also means autonomy or self-determination. The second definition that I think really applies to what we're talking about today regarding health freedom is civil liberty, as opposed to subjection from an arbitrary or despotic government. Now, if you've been following for any, if you've been following me for any length of time, you know that I stand for freedom. I mean, shoot, the the uh, the tagline or the motto for the podcast itself is conserving America's freedom, culture, and values. So I am all about freedom. I am a staunch supporter of freedom, freedom of all kinds. And we've seen a big discussion about what freedoms we actually do have, what freedoms we maybe don't have, or what freedoms we have been attacked over the past couple of years. So I am all for freedom. But I do want to say that I am not... My stance on freedom is that it is necessary for America. It is necessary for America, and when our freedoms are infringed upon... We, the people, need to speak up against that and claim back our freedom. We can't let the government or individuals or corporations keep us from our freedoms that are given to us by the Constitution of the United States. But I am not for freedom in a sense that I don't think there should be any laws, you know, like I don't think we should be living in a lawless society. I believe when it comes to laws and the government having a a hand in that, you know, kind of bringing in, putting guardrails up for our freedoms is necessary. I think that should be the role of the government when it comes to setting laws, putting laws in place to 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 govern, to limit, for lack of a better term, our freedoms. I don't want us to be a lawless society and just leave it up to everyone to do whatever they want, because I honestly don't trust everyone in America to act, to act as they should and which will ultimately cause harm to other people or cause harm to our country. I think that there are certain laws that need to be in place to preserve our America, to help it to function. But I also think that there can be too many laws, right? That there can be too many guardrails put up. And as we've seen over the past couple of years regarding the pandemic, we have seen that when given the opportunity, leaders in our government will take advantage of the powers that they've been given and overreach and step on our freedoms. So when Kalina joins us here in a couple of minutes, we're going to be talking specifically about health freedom. And I can't wait for you to hear her story and the conviction that she is now living by on this health freedom mission. It is a, in my opinion, it is a powerful one. And it is something that has taken her a lot of of bravery, something that I'm not sure I would have had if I was in her position one to two years ago. So without further ado, I want to bring on my guest today, Kalina, also known as That Liberty Chick on social media. She is joining us 
She is a health freedom mom, a medical professional turned personal trainer slash coach, and a real estate investor. She is also the secretary and SCC rep for her Libertarian Party of the Lafayette Parish in Louisiana. Now, I've had the privilege of joining Kalina on a couple of her Instagram lives over the past few months. We've talked about being bold, and we've also talked about the administrative state of our government. So I thoroughly enjoy my conversations with her, and I am happy to be bringing her to you to listen and to watch as we discuss her mission of health freedom. Kalina, thank you very much for joining me. Um, very happy, very happy to have you here on this podcast episode. Uh, I know I've been, <laughs> I've been asking you for I think about a month now uh, when we're going to be able to make this happen. So I'm glad we're able we're able to do it now. Um, <clears throat> I know health freedom is your 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 mission, your primary mission, um, and you are a a huge advocate for it. That is one of the one of the things you dedicate your social media to is advocating for health freedom. Um, and as one of those grassroots voices on Instagram, and I know you recently joined TikTok and everything else, but as the, as your primary mission, can you tell me and the listeners what health freedom actually means? Yes. And thank you, Brian, so much for having me. Um, I'm so excited to be here. This is obviously my first podcast. You know that. So I'm super excited. <laughs> Um, and it's awesome to be able to talk about, you know, um, health freedom and everything. So for me, health freedom is all about, um, bodily autonomy. And that is, you know, the fact that you, you own yourself and you have the right to make decisions about what goes into your body or what doesn't, you have the right to make any, um, health decisions that you see fit for yourself, for your children, um, that you feel are in their best interest or your best interest. And, um, so that's basically health freedom. Another portion of that is, um, informed consent. So I believe really strongly that before people can make a good decision about their health, they need true informed consent. And that means accurate information, um, from both sides of, you know, an issue, whether it's learning all of the possible, um, pros and cons, um, and yeah, that's basically, you know, health freedom. Nobody should coerce anybody else into making a health related decision. Um, I don't believe in any mandates. I think shouldn't be mandated that you have to get certain vaccinations, different things like that. Um, that should really be up to the individual and based on informed consent, as well as, you know, um, their own personal research, if they choose to do so and conversations with their providers. All right. And I know in, in the introduction, uh, introducing you to the listeners, I mentioned your involvement with the, with your local, um, in your local parish for the Libertarian Party. And whenever I hear the word freedom and, you know, I'm a, I'm a conservative, conservative Republican, um, freedom makes me think, okay, freedom, liberty, libertarian. So I'm curious with your health freedom mission, chicken of the egg kind of situation, what, what came for, which came first? Was it, you became an advocate of health freedom and then realized, Oh, well, I'm a libertarian or were you already a libertarian? And then that kind of evolved into this health freedom mission. Can you, can you explain which came first? Yes. Um, so this is hard because it, I don't really think one really came before the other. It was kind of like an overall awakening. Um, so like you, I used to be, um, consider myself a conservative Republican, um, going into 2020, that was, you know, kind of, that was my political thoughts. Um, and then with, you know, different things like the mandates, the lockdowns, um, ma you know, universalized masking, um, masking mandates to go even into the grocery store. I started to think a lot more about um, politics, things like that, policies, how are they making these executive orders, um, different things like that. And so basically, um, the libertarian thing came up. I was having a conversation with my dad, um, on the phone. This was like the summer of 2020. And we were just talking about different ideas. I was expressing frustrations, 
Um, and he, he asked me a few questions and then he said, well, what about this? Do you think that? And, you know, he kind of went off on a tangent. What do you think about this? <laughs> and, um, you know, and I was like, well, yeah, I think that. And he's like, do you think this also? And I was like, yeah, actually I do. And so he, you know, asked me a few questions and then he was like, you know what? You are actually a libertarian. And I was like, huh? I didn't know, you know, I didn't know what that was because at the time, I mean, I, I think I did a little bit, but I wasn't very familiar mm-hmm. and I was just so used to like Republican and Democrat, you know? Um, so right. I looked into it further. Um, I think I went to either the national or it might've been our state, um, Libertarian Party website and they had a little quiz on there and I took the quiz and it confirmed the truth that I am a libertarian. And looking back, I was always libertarian. I've always been very Um, Mm liberty-minded. But I didn't know. I didn't even know that was an option or like a line of thinking. Um, So so that that happened. But simultaneously, you know, there was a lot of health-related stuff going on, um, you know, obviously in the country um, beyond just like the, the, the lockdowns and everything. There was um, the vaccine coming out, the masking, making children mask, making people mask every time when they're in public, different concerns like that. Um, Mm -hmm. And so one thing that I did notice pretty much right away, I think, um, once I started looking into the Libertarian Party, once I started kind of adding them on social media, learning a little bit about their candidates, which was um, Joe Jorgensen. And Spike Cohen, whereas um, she, Joe Jorgensen was the presidential candidate and um, Spike Cohen was her running mate for the 2020 election. And I did see that their party platform was against mandatory vaccination. And that was a huge selling point to me because about the same time in 2020, I started to learn a lot more about um you know, health, I started to learn more kind of about, um, you know, some of the different things going on in the world. I started following, I don't know if you're familiar, if we've talked about this before, but Children's Health Defense, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Um, I was dealing Mm -hmm. with a lot of delays with my own son. He, um, he actually didn't start speaking until he was two and a half, um, which was right about May of 2020. Um, And he was dealing with some other things too, some different, different types of movements, um, you know, just some behavioral stuff that at the time I didn't really understand. But as I started to learn more about um, some, some of this different information that I had never known before, I started to understand how those things could be related. And then it started, which we'll get into that later, but um, it started to spark that idea of wow, we really need to have choice around these products. And um, that became a huge theme to me. So those things kind of went together. And then obviously, just the fact that they were coming out with a new um, mRNA technology vaccine, that it was becoming very clear they were going to want everybody to get, I started to really, really feel the importance of bodily autonomy and the personal choice. So it was just really, really hand in hand all throughout 2020 that kind of brought me um, from where I was to the liberty movement and um, health freedom specifically. Okay. And I know, like you just mentioned your son's situation. I am going to ask you about that here in in a few minutes. Yes. But I know also in previous conversations, in prior conversations with you that, um, and also with the introduction for, for this episode, that you are a former healthcare professional. And I, and I want to emphasize former. So everyone listening or watching to this episode knows that you, you were in the medical field, specifically, correct me if I'm wrong, you were a physician assistant Mm -hmm. and then you had to make a choice. Can you tell us about the choice that you, you ultimately made with your career? Yeah. So I was a, um, practicing physician assistant for six years. I worked in ICU medicine. Um, I worked the entire first year of the pan Demic all the way till April of 2021, um, you know, working in intensive care. I was PRN at the time, but, you know, I, I worked a, a pretty decent amount. Um, so this is a very hard, hard question to answer without a lot of context. But basically, as I started to learn, um, especially about 
the vaccinations, what had happened with my son, um, and just kind of the truth behind all of that, it became very hard for me to accept a lot of the narratives within the field of Mm -hmm. medicine, if that makes sense. Um, As I learned, you know, that there are significant health risks um, associated with those different products, and yet those risks are very minimalized and, you know, we're kind of told safe and safe and effective and different things like that. It just, it became very hard for me to stay on board with that, knowing that there needed to be additional research that wasn't being done. There was a lot of things that need to be looked into, um, for, on behalf of, you know, of children and everything receiving like the entire pediatric CDC schedule. And it just, it kind of became that type of situation with me where I realized that, you know, you can go on a path for so long and then you start to understand that maybe this path is not for you anymore. Um, Mm -hmm. If that makes sense, it's hard to explain the whole background with that Mm -hmm. in such a short, you know, time frame. Yeah. So it sounds like you had this conviction Mm -hmm. and ultimately you decided to follow your convictions, which yes. ultimately led to you leaving your your career, um, because like in the name of of health freedom, it was it's that important to you yes. um, that you yeah you know sacri- sacrificed your your professional career, a very um, well respected career. You know, right? My my brother is a physician assistant, yeah. and I know the amount of schooling and, and knowledge that it takes to have yes. to have that uh, profession. So yes. Ultimately, your conviction for health freedom, you had like you had to sever yourself from from your career, even even though you had grown up for years, I'm sure through school and studying, being told one thing and then like over yeah. time, maybe slowly, maybe a snap snap of the fingers, realize that like you actually can't stand behind the things that you were being told to stand behind, or maybe even being told to to tell your, to tell the patients that you're caring for. Yeah. So, um, I did, I had a pretty unique, um, part of my medicine that I practiced in. Obviously we weren't doing any, um, you know, um, administration of like pediatric vaccines or anything. I only worked with adult Mm -hmm. medicine. Um, and it was totally just acute care. That was everything I did, but there was a step, there is a separate issue of speaking on this topic and working in the field. And some people maintain the ability to do that, but it can become very difficult. And Mm -hmm. I knew that this is something that I needed to talk about and something that I needed to push really hard for given everything with my son. Um, I felt very called to do that. And it was very difficult for me to hold on to um, that position that I held and still speak my mind the way that I needed to. Um, if that makes sense. And of course, like you said, there Mm -hmm. was definitely a time when I realized the difference between what I was taught in school and reality. And I remember the very first thing that sparked that. And it was actually a couple of years, maybe a year prior, maybe about 2019, um, when I was Mm -hmm. reading a Google review um, for some clinic and somebody had mentioned, you know, um, Merck 5, MRC5, um, which is one of the fetal cell lines that they use to produce um, vaccines and different things. Now, I didn't know that they had used aborted fetal cell tissue to create all these vaccines and, um, you know, that they create them within those cell lines. And that was a first moment to me when I realized, like, I wasn't being told the full truth because to me that felt like this wasn't really something that I align with, you know, and to know that that was how they created them. It kind of gave me, um, you know, that like moment where I was like, huh, you know, and they don't really, didn't really disclose it. And there are other fetal cell lines also that they use. Um, but I think that was the first moment of, I didn't know this. What else aren't they telling me? If that makes sense. Now that we've, yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, I've heard of Merck Five. I haven't haven't done any kind of research into it, uh, but I have, uh-huh. you know, <clears throat> heard through. I guess just just living life and reading things and being trying to like you know consuming information. I've 
I've heard of, uh, you know, fetal cells being used for, um, for the development of, of vaccines and certain immunizations. And that's mm-hmm. a big reason why a lot of people will claim uh, like a religious yes. exception or exemption for avoiding um, having, to, having to be vaccinated, uh, immunized for yes. uh, certain immunizations and what have you. Yeah. And that must have been extremely, extremely tough. Like, I mean, I can't, like, I, I, I can't imagine myself, I guess, having that level of conviction. I would hope that if I did have that level of conviction about something similar to yours, that I would uh, be brave enough, be, be bold enough to, to stand firm and say, like, you know, I, based on principles and, and other reasons, I, you know, I can't stand for this and I need to, to get out of here and I'll figure it out late. You know, I'll figure it out as I go along. Yeah. So I, I applaud you for being able able to do that. Yeah. Um, and I know that you've, you've mentioned your, your son now a couple of times. So I want to pivot from you professionally to getting more into personal and regarding your son's story. Um, can you just share what you're comfortable sharing with regarding, regarding his story? And, and I feel like that also has a major impact into your mission for, for health freedom. Yes, of course. So my son, he is four years old. Um, I, had a completely normal pregnancy with him. Um, I was very one of those moms who read everything. I wanted to know every guideline. I wanted to do everything exactly correct. You know, no blanket till he's one, sleep on his back. You know, I didn't take any medications right. when I was pregnant. Um, and I was just, I was extremely diligent about many, many things. And one thing that I did not look at um, and I was even very interested in in, in autism um, specifically. I never thought that that would be something that I would experience or that my child would experience, but I wanted to know more about it because I've always had such a research mindset. I've always had such a, a mindset of questioning things like, why is this? How have they not figured this out? You know, why why is the incidence rising? What are the risk factors? You know, what are they missing? And things like that I will attach myself to and want to know, um, you know, if there's a question out there that I feel needs an answer or that there could be an answer. Um, so I looked into that a lot and I will say I never the entire time, um, questioned that it could be caused by the pediatric vaccines that are administered. Um, I went along and had, you know, my son, he had every single vaccination on the CDC schedule, um, on time because I was very diligent that I wanted to be a good mom and do everything that they told me to. Um, although I will say in the back of my mind, you know, the whole time I was thinking, Oh, what, why does he need that one? You know, maybe he doesn't need this one. You know, maybe I should just say no to that one. That disease doesn't sound like a big deal. But I wasn't strong Mm -hmm. at that point, um, and I didn't have that level of conviction or that ability to stand up for myself or even really question authority, and so I just went along with it. And I didn't have the ability to question, you know, too much my profession, um, especially, like, as a physician assistant. Like, not that I couldn't question physicians, but just when something is so like, no, this is what you need to do. Like there's that, that level of, I wasn't ready yet to, um, fully break through from that. And especially when it comes to being a good mom, you're thinking, okay, I have to do what this person is telling me to do. Otherwise I'm not being a good mom. So Mm -hmm. my son, you know, like I said, he was born, you know, totally just perfectly on time. He was a C-section. Um, but you know, he was like a, a very engaged baby. He was always hitting his milestones, everything like that. Um, good eye contact, loved to play, babbled from the time he was like, could the first, you know, like time when babies can babble, he was already babbling. Um, so mm-hmm. stuff went along really good for him. He, and he ate everything too. I used to give him when he was little avocado, um, ground turkey, and he would just pick it up and eat it, you know, bananas, different stuff like that. Um, Everything was going along great. So I think he was about one one year old, maybe, when some of the milestones started to, like, he walked a little a little bit late, but that might have been kind of normal for him. Um, 
but probably looking back, looking back at photos for sure, I noticed a change right about the 15 months in his demeanor in the photos and it lasted about four months. So Mm -hmm. he went from, you know, picture of him with me and we're looking at the camera together to every picture. He's like this pushing me away. Every picture he's like, you know, like he doesn't want to be there. He won't look at the camera. He's trying to, he's like noticeably upset. Um, Right. But at the time I didn't really notice it. You know, you're with someone every single day. I spent so much time with him. I didn't really notice, you know, I mean, I knew he was like getting little illnesses and stuff like that. He was cranky, but I didn't notice how much his demeanor had changed. And, um, he wasn't, you know, really saying words. I think, I believe he still always babbled. I don't remember a time when he didn't babble, but, um, it was probably that summer. So 15 months, he was probably about, you know, that might've been like spring, early springtime, late winter. Um, come that summer, we had, um, the first thing I noticed was like little toys that either like lit up or had like a noise or something they would make. He'd be like staring at it, just pressing it over and over things like that. Like, and so I was like, okay, he's just too into these toys. I need to take them away. Um, and so that was my thought, you know, he's just too engaged with these things. They're distracting him from learning. That's probably why he's not talking, you know? So I had taken those things away. Um, and then we had, we needed a, a, a sitter. Um, so I had a couple of ladies come and that was kind of the first time when they started to say things like, oh, he doesn't really want to engage. And I was thinking, what? Like, I was shocked that they were saying that I didn't, you know, he had been out of childcare for a few months at that point. And so I just, I was so used to being with him. I didn't really, you know, know what they were talking about, but, um, one of the the ladies ended up working with him and it was kind of the same thing. She kept pointing stuff out and I was like, no, no. But, but honestly, I never really spent time around children. So I didn't know. Um, yeah. Like, like a better. reference point. Yeah. Like I didn't know a reference point and it was just, and maybe it's because he wasn't changing so much from when he was an infant that I wasn't noticing anything different, you know, but she was like, he should be doing this. He should be doing that. Those type of things. Um, Mm -hmm. So moving forward, you know, at first when he was about two, you know, we started talking speech delay, um, stuff like that. He had started having some hand movements, um, that he would get sometimes maybe about when he was about two, a little over two years old to like two and a half. And so those things kind of struck me. I had taken him to the pediatrician for that and everything, but I still wasn't really putting things together. I was just thinking speech delay And, um, I don't know why he's doing this, you know? And so he didn't start talking until he was two and a half. I had to really work with him, um, on everything. We, what we had gone screen free because I started to, you know, think that that was part of the issue and it would exacerbate his stuff. But I was still in the mindset, like what, you know, I didn't know, like my dad was a late talker. I was thinking he was just going to be a late talker. Um, so he did learn to start talking, but there was just a lot of repeating things like that. And basically, you know, as time went on, it just become more apparent, like he's not progressing like other children are, um, he can talk, but he will also start to repeat things. And I just, it really started to hit me what was going on with him. So this summer, I believe, um, you know, he went to see the pediatric neurologist. They didn't diagnose him with autism because apparently that somebody else uh, specialized has to do that. And you only really need to do it if you're wanting certain services um, for them. But, okay. but essentially that was, you know, that's essentially what, what is going on with him. Um, so that, that was hard for me and then hard to understand, you know, And looking back and everything, Mm -hmm. why did this happen? You know, what, what was really going on? Because he didn't really have anything, any reasons as a baby or anything. Um, So I had started to, people had shared stuff from Children's Health Defense and Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And different sources like that, um, different books about vaccines and aluminum and things I had never heard of, never thought about, never even 
known. And that was when things started to get put together for me. Like, and the realization now that he's not like an outlier. This isn't just him. This is like, I read an article actually on Children's Health Defense website just two days ago that said there was some numbers that they found in California. Um, and I don't remember if it was just like one county or a city or something, but the numbers were close to one in 16 currently children with autism. And one in 16. Wow. Yeah. And I wish I had this citation for that, but it was on, um, it was on the defender. So children's health defense website, and it was part of their statistics on there. Um, the numbers are growing everywhere you turn. There are ABA centers popping up. If you go online, cause you know, I was job searching for a while, figuring out what I wanted to do. Um, over the past few months, it, you know, there's just job after job for like ABA technician or, uh, you know, different autism services and everything. And the numbers are just mm-hmm. exploding. Um, and it's, it's not just autism, you know, speech delay is same thing. Um, and then of course, different chronic diseases for children, asthma, um, allergies, different things like that. Um, autoimmune issues, eczema, things like that, you know, that all kinds of research is showing that these are likely tied, you know, um, to what the pediatrician is giving these children. Um, And that is a huge reason why we didn't see these types of numbers of chronic illness. And I believe it's like 50% of children or something have some type of chronic disease. One in six children now has developmental delay. Um, and we didn't see those type of numbers 50 years ago. So that, Mm -hmm. um, that's the story with my son. So he, he has good days and bad days. Um, and it's terrible. I wouldn't like wish it on anybody. Um, you know, we have times when we go to the grocery store and he's just, he's screaming. He doesn't, he starts to get overwhelmed. You know, he is a child that hits himself in the face, um, pretty constantly. And that started about six months ago. Um, so it's really hard. It's so hard. And like I said, I wouldn't wish, wish it on anybody. Um, and it's unfortunate to know that there are so many children, of course it's a spectrum. So all are not going to have his situation. Um, exactly. But it's very difficult. And then just not to not to be able to communicate well with your child. Like I can't ask him what he did today. He is not able to tell me now we can talk about stuff that is in front of us. Um, it's a truck. Look, the truck is, is orange. Like we can have those conversations, but if I say, what did you do earlier? He cannot answer me. Um, if I, I asked him, we got, you know, a kitty and I asked him, what do you want to name it? He can't, really grasp that in order to give an, a name, even when I gave him options, it's really hard. Now he knows the cat's name now. Um, and you know, he knows our dog's name and everything, but, um, you know, if that makes sense, I can't, it like, what's your favorite color? He can't tell me he can name all the colors though. He can say every letter, um, of the alphabet. Mm -hmm. He can count, identify numbers. He can read words, it's a very difficult thing to deal with, um, just to, to see somebody struggle like that, just to communicate, um, their thoughts. And so what I say is that, you know, one in 34 boys, that was their old doubt statistics from like 2008, but that's kind of what they rolled out to us. Most boys, that was their old doubt statistics from like 2008, but that's kind of what they rolled out to us most recently. Obviously it's growing even faster than that, but, um, I say that has to be somebody, somebody's child, one out of every 34 moms with a son, then I say, you know, it, it might as well have been me because I look at my son and I see him struggle. And I say, you know, those, those pediatric vaccinations can cause this in children. And yet they're telling us, no, they're giving us Mm -hmm. different, different, those pediatric vaccinations can cause this in children. And yet they're telling us, no, they're giving us different, different reasons that aren't, you know, they're not adequate. They're not doing the right research. Um, He does struggle with is, you know, my drive to just keep talking about it. Struggle with is, you know, my drive to just keep talking about it. 
and, um, Mm -hmm. you know, just spreading the message, doing what I do, um, and raise awareness for places like Children's Health Defense that um, share a lot of good good resources for places like Children's Health Defense that um, share a lot of good good research. They work on looking into things like this. And Morgan, I believe he was also licensed in Washington. He actually didn't require all his patients, like most pediatricians do, to follow the CDC schedule. He kind of let them pick and choose. He gave them real informed consent. And he ended up with children who were totally unvaccinated, children who were partially vaccinated and children who were fully vaccinated. Now he had a, you know, a large amount of patients. He started to run studies on these patients to show, you know, which ones had the highest incidence of eczema, autoimmune, asthma, um, autism, ADHD. And he found by far it was the fully, you know, the fully vaccinated children by far had much higher incidence of all these things followed by the, the intermediately vaccinated, you know, like partially vaccinated children. And lowest right. was the unvaccinated children. And I believe that he didn't have any children with ADD or um, autism in the, in the fully unvaccinated, I believe, population. So he had come out with this study about a year ago, I think. Mm-hmm. And they actually, the Oregon Medical Board... Uh, started coming against him shortly after with different accusations. And it's a huge blow. You know, this person's out there on a limb. They're doing the research that's very good, that shows us something real about what's happening in their patient population. And Mm -hmm. then all of a sudden now they're not able to practice medicine. Now, last I heard, he did get his medical license back. but, um, But that's what people are up against, you know, when you start to talk about the truth. Um, and that's why it can be so scary for so many, um, especially someone with him that has data like that. So, right. Yeah. And I know you're talking, you know, just now about your son and and his situation and his, his story, um, also your story and talking about like for, for pediatricians and for within pediatrics and the requirements for immunizations, you know, I think every, I don't, I don't want to. I don't want to be wrong in my, in my statement, but I know most state, most states, if not all, you know, require certain immunizations for school Mm -hmm. uh, K through 12 and Florida requires them. And they have a few exemptions, a way to be exempt, uh, religion and, Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, medical, I I think are, are two, two of them. There might be a third, but one of the things that we heard a lot about, um, when it comes to health freedom also was for adults right Mm -hmm. for the past year um well i guess december of 2020 into the early part of 2021 when the um covid vaccines were rolled out we heard a lot of people you know starting to put their hands up and saying like hey you know i want i have the right to decide whether or not i want you know want to put this into into my body and we've been hearing that now for for more than a year yes you know we've had the fights with mandates and and everything so health freedom is, isn't just confined to pediatrics. It is now, you know, yeah, the whole, the whole age range, right. From, from infancy through your, your last days here on earth. Yes. Um, and I just, I bring that up and because <clears throat> I want like the listeners and, and the viewers to, to realize like, you know, the story you just told, is about your son who is four. I have a son who's four years old and I, I, I just, I can't imagine um, going through that. So you are a very, very strong woman, a very strong mom and a loving mom, but like health freedom is, is bigger than just, just pediatrics, right? Like yes. you're advocating, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're advocating for everyone to have a level of freedom, everyone to be able to have or be given informed consent. Yes. Um, yeah. Across the whole the whole age spectrum, and then also, uh, you talked about that doctor up, up in Oregon and running his own study based on his his patients, his pediatric patients, mm-hmm. and then getting his license taken away from him, and and possibly having that back now. And I just kept thinking about how we were we were hearing things similar, like whenever there is someone who dissents from the what's the term that I'm looking for, but like basically the party, the party line, the company line, so to speak, like, especially yes. if you're working within a hospital, you know, you mm-hmm. feel like you can't speak out because you're, 
you know, you could just be be fired. Yes. We heard stories about that through the pandemic of these doctors, like, you know, wanting to raise their hand and feeling like they couldn't because they're going to get uh, fired from the, the medical practice that they're a part of or the hospital system that they're a part of and, and yes. all their affiliated hospitals and so on and so forth. So I, I did, this just all ties into um, health freedom from specific to your son's story yes. to what we've witnessed during the pandemic and then the uh, the doctor in Oregon, his story to what we also witnessed with that uh, dissenting opinion in the pandemic. Um, so I say all that to, to ask you this now, Kalina, is when you think of health freedom and your mission, what are you, tr what is the goal? Is there like something, is there like a, uh, a, a like a, a a certain point to where you can say like, yes, health freedom has been attained. Um, like what, what, do, if you, re, if your, your mission as it plays out, mm -hmm. what, what, is, what do we have to get to as a country to say like, yes, we now have health freedom. Yes. So yeah, that's a very, that's a, a complicated question. Cause like you said, there are many factors and I think, um, one thing that I'll say is that with the current pandemic and obviously they're pushing, like, this is true assault on, on health freedom to say, like, you have to have a, a vaccine just to go to a certain city or to go to restaurants or different things like that. That's obviously very extreme and something we never had seen in the past. Um, and something that we really need to stand up against now. I also think it's good because it's shedding light on that greater issue of children like my son who really just didn't receive informed consent because like you said, there's like a, a, a company line or like a, I mean, basically that's because of the CDC has guidelines and um, physicians feel that they cannot really go against them. And there's a lot of other things that have to go into that too, reimbursement and stuff like that. But um, so that's kind of one factor. One factor is that uh, especially for like those, the pediatric schedule and stuff, we need real informed consent. We need, um, you know, doctors and providers to be able to make those, um, you know, decisions and distinctions like a little bit more autonomously instead of just, this is what the CDC says, and this is what I have to do better research, things like that. Now, when it comes to the pandemic, of course, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of ways that the government is getting overly involved, you know, in, in the practice of medicine. Um, and the CDC, you know, saying that doctors can't prescribe certain medications, even if they feel that that's going to help their patient, um, you know, different things like that. That's a huge overstep and something that we need to really see as a red flag. It's something that, you know, has always been going on, like I'm saying with the CDC guidelines for everything, but these are red flags with the way that they're doing it and they're curtailing, especially during an emergency, um, when maybe a provider feels that they're doing something in good faith and they have research to back it up and that, you know, an agency can come along and say no. Um, and then yes, of course, like different things like saying that you have to have, you know, a, a a vaccine just to go somewhere or get a negative test, even if you're not having symptoms, those, those are like, you know, above and beyond problems when it comes to health freedom. That's obviously the absence of having health freedom. They're coercing um, people into doing stuff. Same thing with like workplaces requiring. Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe that workplaces should require you ever to inject something into your body. Um, and that goes back decades, you know, with, with the, the flu shot, um, that they require nurses to take every single year. I don't believe that that's right. And now of course they've come up with this new, um, MRNA technology vaccine for the COVID and wanting to say that they can require that. Now those are huge oversteps of bodily autonomy of those people. And then of course, even not even healthcare workers, or also facing the same thing. I think different government employees, different, they had tried with, um, mm -hmm. sorry, my battery. Um, they had tried with different, you know, industries like that, saying businesses or companies with over a hundred employees. 
And those are the things that we really need to fight back against. Um, the, the masking of children in school is another, another thing. So, um, I would say to me, the measure would be, you know, people need true informed consent and no coercion to take any of these products. Um, and yeah, like I, I personally, you know, there are different exemptions that people can get. Those are mostly designed for school children. Like you have pointed out, they, um, work often in, in workplaces too. Um, but, or, I mean, some of them might be designed for workplaces also. Some get, can get denied at different times, but I don't believe that people should have to do that or make a reason why they don't want these products. And I also believe that the more we let that line get blurry, the, the more things that they might start to, um, require. So. Right. Yeah. We have to, <clears throat> we've seen a whole lot of things play out over the past, uh, two years now and most recently with the the employer mandate and you know that being ruled unconstitutional through through osha that that work around that that uh, mm -hmm. the biden administration tried tried to find you know ultimately got got struck down but transitioning and looking forward uh Kalina, i want to ask you how can others link arms with you in your pursuit of of health health freedom in this mission and then also um what do you have planned if anything right now for the near in the near term uh, regarding your mission yes yeah, so i've thought about this a lot and the thing that i think that we need to do because the big voices out there they they come up with a lot of you know they share a lot of good information that's like i've talked about children's health defense the high wire that's del big tree um you know robert f Kennedy jr is one of them and there there's many other voices going all the way back to jenny mccarthy um for the autism so they, a, a lot of those, um, a lot of those, um, or sharing their names out to other people so that they can get that information and look into these things further. And then more importantly though, I would say, because there's, there's a lot of silencing, um, when it comes to like the internet or sharing information and stuff like that. But the more importantly is just having the everyday conversations. Mm -hmm. So if this is something you believe, tell people. If you believe that you have the right to bodily autonomy and the conversation comes up, please say it because someone else is thinking it and they're too afraid to say it. But if you say it, they're going to feel comfortable saying it. And then they'll feel comfortable saying it in another room because they heard you say it. And if we can continue that conversation, um, things can start to get better mm -hmm. on, on a grander scale for that. Um, same thing with, you know, I believe that if you have questions, you need to ask your provider. Um, if they don't give you an answer that you're comfortable with or the answer seems too short or it's kind of along the lines of like, you know, I'm the expert or these have been safe and effective or that's data has shown that's not true, always feel empowered to ask a follow-up question with more detail. I want an actual mm -hmm answer, you know, not just kind of a line, if that makes sense. So if you, if their answer doesn't really make you feel better or doesn't provide true data or true information or a resource, you should always feel comfortable to continue asking questions. And it's, it's important that you do that because that's going to make that person think about that stuff, maybe look into it because they're going to think, darn, somebody might ask me this complicated question again. I need to go learn the answer instead of just dictating off the sheet that they handed me. And that's going to make them a better provider for the next person and for you when you come back and it's going to open their minds. So right. that would be my, my thing that I would tell people is that just those everyday conversations are what's going to change the world. Just saying it out loud and not letting them say, oh, you're an anti-vaxxer or, um, or if they say that, and if people say that to me, I say, sure, like, I'm not, I'm not ashamed. Like, what do you want? You think I'm embarrassed of that? No, you know, um, don't let them shame you. Don't let them make you feel guilty. Um, if you have a thought or a question or, or even lump you in a group, maybe you're not in that group. You don't need to be lumped in that group, but maybe you just have some doubts and you shouldn't let anyone make you feel bad about that. And I think that that is how we change the narrative, just day-to-day -day conversations, like a grassroot type of movement like that. Right. And I think I remember, um, I think I remember you posting something to your Instagram a little while back, maybe a couple of months ago that yeah. talked about, you know, sp speaking up because someone 
is probably thinking the same thing you are wanting to ask the same questions you are. I think your post was something along the lines yes. of, you know, whenever I hear someone saying yeah. that they feel like they can't speak out, I feel like I have to speak out, you know, that much more, right? You said something, I think, along those lines. Um, so I said whenever someone else felt that they didn't have the right to say no, that they had to take the vaccine, the mRNA vaccine, even though they didn't want to. Well, that's what the post was getting at. I keep them vague so that they don't get censored on Instagram. But um, it, whenever someone says that, you know, they wanted to say no, but they felt like they couldn't, then my no means that much more. Yep. So I say, you know, if you can say no and you're in that place, you might be doing it for 10 people who got felt that they were getting coerced into doing something that they didn't want to do. And it's that much more important that someone says no, because if everyone goes along with it, then, you know, they have ultimate power. Somebody has to be the one to say no. And um, so if you're in that position and it's in your heart, then, you know, I encourage people to do so. Not everyone is capable of doing that. For me, it's a decision I made for myself and everyone has to make that decision for themselves. Right. Awesome. Well, Kalina, thank you so much for, for joining me on this podcast episode. Um, I'm really thankful that you took the time to, to join me and to tell us about health freedom and your story, your son's story, your, your professional and, and personal stories and you know what health freedom looks like now and, and moving forward and how people can get involved with you. Uh, so will you please just uh, before you before you go, uh, just let the listeners and the viewers know how they can can follow you on social media or how they can can get in touch with you. And like I said a little bit ago, link arms with you if they also want to walk this journey with you. Yes, definitely. So you can find me on Instagram, that Liberty chick, all one word. There's no like, underscores uh, or anything. you know, dots or anything. Yeah. Nothing like that. It's just that Liberty chick want to talk about any of these subjects please feel free to DM me. Um, and if you would like to do an Instagram live, I do about three to four Instagram lives every single week to talk about health, freedom, liberty, just the state of the country, everything that's going on right now. So um, holistic health, different things like that. I always answer my DMs as long as they're respectful. Um, I always strive to answer any comments um, that I receive. And, you know, I just, I appreciate everyone. So if y'all want to find me on those platforms, that's where I'm at. All right. Well, thank you again, Kalina, for joining me and we will talk soon. Okay. Thank you so much, Brian. I really appreciate it for you having me on here. What a fantastic interview right there with Kalina. And I just want to say that she brought up a few things that after this episode, I'm going to need to go and do some self-reflection to figure out where I stand with health freedom, where I stand with informed consent. Because I'll be honest, I have kids of my own and I have two boys and they are both toddlers. And I know for me personally that whenever it came to the immunizations for them, and we're still going through their immunization schedule, I honestly did not think twice about these potential side effects of these immunizations. But hearing her say that statistics are showing that one in 34 children are being severely affected by some of these immunizations. And right now, knock on wood, praise to the Lord, my boys have not been affected in that way. I feel like I'm a lucky one. Naive but lucky. So there are some serious takeaways for me after that conversation with her. Because like I said, my boys are just toddlers. They still have immunizations to go to complete, you know, their immunization uh, checklist. So do I really want them to continue with their immunizations? That's something my wife and I are going to have to discuss. And I want to challenge you, the listener, the viewer, to do the same thing, right? Is there something, whether it's health freedom or something something else in your life where you have just gone with whatever you have been told for pretty much your entire life to trust X, you know, um, X body, X 
government ex corporate, you know, company? Have you really taken the time to do research upon those things? You know, whatever it is, these type of decisions that you're having to make or things you're having to go along to, to get along with. And if you find something that you don't agree with or you have questions about, are you going to speak up like she did? That's something that I'm going to take for, away from that, from that interview is, what would I do in that situation? And as my boys continue to grow and continue to need these immunizations, like to meet the requirements and everything for based on the state of Florida, the Department of Health, do we want to continue? You know, what really are the side effects? Are, are, am I really putting my boys at risk? That's something my wife and I are going to have to look at and, going to have, and are going to need to discuss with one another. So yes, we talked about health freedom, which is very important. In the past couple of episodes, I talked about the administrative state and how they have overreached and infringed upon some of our freedoms. And that has been, freedom has been a big topic of discussion, especially on the political right in 2021 and now continuing into 2022. So I want to challenge you again. Take the time to think about the conversation Kalina and I just had, whether it is regarding health freedom or other things in your lives that you are having to go along with. Do the research. I know I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to do that, but I challenge you to do the research, to become informed and then make your decision. Right. We're not saying, I'm not saying, hey, you need to come to this decision, but I'm challenging you and I'm also challenging now myself to do the research, to do your due diligence, and to come to an informed decision. So don't just take what you've been told, take the time to research and check on what you've been told. And ultimately, what Kalina is wanting through health freedom and what I am wanting freedom in a broader sense is for us to have the freedoms to do this research and to speak out if we feel like we need to and to ask questions or to stand up for the rights that we've been given when they've been infringed upon. Thank you for joining me for episode 36. As always, thank you for your support. Remember to like and subscribe to the podcast, and I will see you again next week. Thank you for listening to Counterthought, a podcast conserving America's freedom, culture, and values. Remember to subscribe and like or rate the podcast on your podcast app or on YouTube, and engage with the podcast on Instagram at counter underscore thought at counterthought CEO or on Facebook at Counterthought Podcasts. 